two lessons prompted you to take action, to order a set of plans, and to order the parts and materials for your guitar. This lesson, however, is going to be just a little bit different. I urge you to put away the credit card for now and just listen. I'm going to show you some of the tools around my shop. Some of these tools are totally necessary, while others are just plain fun, or they make the job easier. You are encouraged to take notes but not encouraged to purchase any of the tools you see here, yet. What I really want you to do is, as you go through the content of this course, lesson by lesson, purchase the tools as you go. It's much smarter that way. You will end up making wiser purchases and you won't have any extra junk tools around the shop that you never really use. I also encourage students to rent or borrow tools as much as possible. There is likely a wood shop or a maker space in your area where you can rent time, especially on some of the larger equipment, such as thickness sanders or band saws. Call up some friends, look on Craigslist. It's very likely that a lot of these tools are right under your fingertips if you look hard enough. So once again, I want you to relax, grab a beer, a water, an orange juice, whatever. Just take notes while we're gonna go through some of the tools. Fight the urge to purchase the tools right now, and then as you go through the lessons, lesson by lesson, pick up the tools that you need for the job as you go. Only the tools we need for the job at the time. The number five jack plane finds a myriad of uses around my shop most notably for jointing long edges, such as the joint for the top and back plates. I also use this general purpose plane for thicknessing stock before fine tuning the thickness on a drum sander. This miniature hand plane made from an ebony block is called a thumb plane. It is certainly not a necessity, but it does make some jobs like trimming brace tops a whole lot of fun. The block plane is an excellent companion to the jack plane. The block plane is useful for jointing edges and thicknessing small surfaces such as the scarf joint for the neck. I use four chisels for work on guitars. I use a one inch, three quarter of an inch, quarter inch, and an eighth inch chisel. But I could easily get by with just the one inch and the quarter inch. It is wiser to invest in a good quality one inch and quarter inch chisel rather than a whole set of cheap low quality chisels. I do, however, keep some bargain variety chisels, such as this one, around for general use in the shop, just to save the edge on my good chisels. The spoke shave was designed for use in shaping and smoothing curved surfaces, such as chair legs, wheel spokes, and in this case, guitar necks. Make sure your spoke shave has a flat plane rather than a radius plane. Card scrapers are great for smoothing surfaces if you know how to sharpen them and use them. Otherwise, you can just use sandpaper for smoothing. In a pinch, a razor blade can quickly and easily be honed into an effective mini scraper, simply by drawing the razor's edge across an edge of hard steel, such as the edge of your bandsaw table. The back saw is designed for precision cuts. Unlike most other saw types, the back saw has a metal rib opposite the cutting edge to limit flexing of the blade. The only drawback is that the metal rib prevents you from cutting beyond a certain depth. The larger variety of back saws, which you see here, 
is not of much use unless you do not have access to power tools and need something heavy duty for cross cuts. The dovetail saw is a small back saw set to leave a narrow kerf. I keep two 10 inch dovetail saws on hand. A low quality saw for my rough cuts and a high quality saw with a kerf specifically designed for cutting fret slots. The Japanese pull saw has a thin blade and it cuts on the pull stroke. This saw doesn't see a whole lot of action in my shop because I do my rip cuts on the table saw or the band saw. However, if you are working without the use of power tools, then the pull saw may be a viable option. The razor saw can be found at hobby stores. It is similar in form and function to the dovetail saw, just scaled down a bit. I use this saw to cut notches in my braces. The coping saw is designed for cutting curves. I keep one around for a number of uses, but more often than not, the band saw replaces my need for a coping saw. The jeweler's saw, on the other hand, is irreplaceable for fine inlay work. This is essentially a super fine coping saw. I use fine and extra fine blades. The blades come in packs of 20 or more because breaking a blade is a relatively common occurrence. Wooden cam clamps are the backbone of a luthier's clamp supply. They are lightweight, quick and easy to use, have a secure grip, and a high clamping pressure, though not as high as other clamps. C-clamps are a bit more heavy duty. If you're just getting started, I'd recommend picking up 4 inch, 1 and half inch, and some deep reach C-clamps. I'd recommend two of each. Ibex bridge clamps are lightweight clamps designed specifically for gluing the bridge to the soundboard. Spring clamps are lightweight, low cost, and even easier to use than cam clamps. Just squeeze the trigger and release. The trade-off is in strength. Spring clamps are only as strong as their spring. They are great for any situation where you simply need an extra hand. The relatively light hold is enough for aligning and marking out dimensions. A variety of flat, round, and triangular files find many uses throughout the build process. These need not be expensive items. In fact, a single set containing a variety of files can be purchased for very cheap at most hardware stores. Needle files are equally useful and equally inexpensive. Once again, you will want a variety of flat, round, and triangular files. As the name implies, nut slotting files are designed specifically with nut slotting in mind. The nut slots are cut to the exact diameter of that slot's string, or slightly larger. Therefore, you will need a variety of nut slotting files to match or very nearly match the gauges of your strings. A razor knife with a variety of razor blade attachments can be immensely useful, and for very cheap. I also keep single edge razor blades handy for use as mini scrapers, among other uses. Any set of strong nippers will work, 
but I like these fret nippers from Stuart McDonald because the front face is ground flat, allowing the nippers to reach in flush with the fretboard. Of course, you can always use an ordinary set and grind the front face flat yourself. An ordinary carpenter's hammer will not work for hammering frets, as it will mar the fret wire. The ideal fretting hammer is lightweight and has a plastic or a brass head. The hammer I most commonly use is filled with shot, making it a dead blow hammer. This reduces recoil and makes fretting just a little bit easier. You can also avoid hammering altogether and press your frets in instead. I often hammer my frets in, but then use the Jaws 2 fret press pictured here to press in any fret ends that did not seat well. A 6 inch square of decent quality should be the only square you need for marking and checking for square. Reliable straight edges are essential. For guitar work, it is good to have an 18 inch and a 24 inch straight edge. I also own a notched straight edge. This straight edge is notched to fit over the frets. That way I can check the relief of the fretboard without the frets interfering with the measurement. This is, of course, useful for guitar setup and repair work. A caliper is used to measure the thickness of stock. In guitar work, its most notable use is in measuring the thickness of the plates and the sides. A set of feeler gauges is used to measure gap widths. Each metal strip has a precise thickness that when fitted between two surfaces, reveals the clearance of the gap. In guitar work, its most notable use is in nut slotting and setup work. An adjustable protractor can be useful for marking out and checking the headstock angle at the scarf joint. Radius gauges are used to check the radius of the fretboard. This is really a guitar setup and repair instrument, and not entirely necessary for a guitar build. Radius blocks are nothing more than blocks of wood with a concave radius. Sandpaper is attached to the radius face and the block is then used to transfer the radius to the fretboard through vigorous sanding. Unless you order your fret wire pre-bent, you are going to need to bend your fret wire without kinking it. The fret bender is a simple tool that utilizes a set of sliders and a crank to bend the wire to a consistent radius. This tool can either be bought from a luthier supplier or homemade from items found at almost any hardware store. The string spacing ruler is far from essential, however I find that it saves me time and allows for greater accuracy when measuring out my string spacing, so I recommend it. A heat gun allows me to safely unstick surfaces that I've temporarily fixed together with double stick tape. The heat gun is also essential for heavy repair or restoration work. In some cases, a hair dryer can substitute. A handheld drill is essential even if you have access to a drill press. I use an assortment of bits. I prefer bits with brad points. A quality set of Forstner bits is nice to have, but not essential.
A laminate trimmer is an undersized, underpowered version of a wood router. This router is often the smarter choice, as the larger machines can be unwieldy in certain situations. I also use a full-size router in a plunge base for certain operations, such as routing the mortise and tenon for the neck. I use a variety of rulers, both standard and metric. An inspection mirror, such as the kind used by automotive technicians, is important for repair work because it allows you to see the top braces through the sound hole. I use a Dremel tool for many applications where controllability and precision routing are necessary, such as with fine inlay work, and in routing the channel for the rosette. I use a 3 32nds of an inch spiral downcut bit for most applications, and a 16th inch bit for finer applications. For hand bending the sides, you need a heated, curved surface. You can fashion your own setup using steel or aluminum pipe and a propane torch, but I would recommend simply purchasing a bending iron with a built-in heating element, such as this bending iron from Luthier's Mercantile. Bending sides is tricky enough as it is for a beginner, and you don't want to have to fuss with a shoddy setup. All sanding can be done by hand, but a random orbital sander is nice to have around for certain operations when heavy sanding is necessary. The random orbital sander is favored over other hand sanders, such as a finished sander, because it leaves a random scratch pattern without any swirl marks. A base that fits your Dremel tool is necessary for setting the depth of your bit and stabilizing the Dremel. Stuart McDonald makes a great base, but it's a little pricey. There are cheaper alternatives, but you sacrifice a little bit of controllability. A circle cutter that can attach to the Dremel base is also necessary for certain operations, such as creating and installing the rosette. Now let's talk about some of the large stationary power equipment that can make the project a lot easier for you. You don't actually need any of these machines. Hand tools can be used instead, but I highly recommend finding access to these power tools if you don't have access already. Not only will it be less physically demanding, but it will make the learning curve much easier. This does not mean that I recommend that the student go out and purchase these machines. Rather, I would recommend that the student rents time on a machine at a local wood shop or makerspace, or borrows equipment from a friend. I use a 14 inch bandsaw with a half inch blade for resawing the book matched pairs of the top and back. I use a quarter inch blade for most other operations because it can handle curves. A smaller, more economical model, such as this one, will work for some, but not all, operations. For example, this model does not have the clearance to resaw the plates. Sometimes I use a bench grinder if the bolt for my neck joint is too long. I get a lot of use out of my belt sander and it saves me a lot of time sanding. Most models include an attached disc sander which can also be very useful. A drill press can take a lot of the headaches out of drilling accurately. However, if you don't have access to one, keep in mind that a handheld drill can be used instead. A router table is necessary for routing the channel for the truss rod. I also use it to route the headstock shape and the bridge shape.
certain cuts are easier on the table saw than they are on the bandsaw. I made this thickness sander from plans that are available online. Well that's it for now, I hope you enjoyed the tour. To see the tools that you will need to complete the next lesson, please see the next lesson and read under the notes section. Thank you.